Friends, I want to welcome you to this online space of worship, The Table. And whether you're with us concurrently on Wednesday night as it's premiering, or you're watching throughout your week, you are welcome here, and your presence matters so much to create this space of worship. Won't you join us as we begin by hearing these words that guide our worship and our community here. We gather together to turn our hearts toward the God of love and the face of our neighbor. We embrace the mystery that God is both beyond our grasp and closer than our breath. We reject the allure of power-hungry religion and embrace the beauty of Jesus' path of surrender. Because we come from different places and have different stories, we commit to listening well and learning together about the Spirit's movement amongst us. We work to become a community of love and forgiveness. Won't you worship with us today? Let's sing this to God. You, you're not afraid of our questions. Offended by our fear, we just really want to trust, and we we just really want to trust you. So we bring, so we bring what we have. Will you meet us here, Lord? You have told, Lord, you have told us. You're for us, even when we don't understand, and we are leaning on that promise, believing you are who you say. for our failure oh in you you always find the best in us yeah and we we may stray but you are faithful so we fall so we fall into we know you raise us up, yeah. Lord. Lord, you have told us you're for us, even when we don't understand. And we are leaning on that promise, Believe, believing you are who you say. Lord, you told, Lord, you have told us. You're for us, even when we don't understand, and we are leaning on that promise, believing, believing you are who you say you are, yeah. Truth in the light. You 
But now more than ever, the word about Jesus spread abroad. Many crowds were gathered to hear him and to be cured of their diseases. Meanwhile, he would slip away to deserted places and pray. As we begin the season of Lent together, we're shifting our focus to a new series and a series that will focus really on being in our bodies and practicing our spiritual lives together. This series will focus on spiritual practices that we can do together and also in our own personal um, devotional time, our own time as we reflect on God. And so we wanna take time in our sermon series together, not only to learn about those practices, but to actually do them together. As we walk through Lent, the season of preparation before Easter, it's a season of reflection, a season of repentance, and it's also a season where we get to connect with Jesus's humanity. Tonight, we're gonna to get to hear a story about Jesus being fully human, being a person, needing silence and rest. So that's gonna be our invitation. Before we get started, I wanna ask you this question. What is it that you feel in your body when you feel like you need to cope? Now, before you answer that, I wanna give you an example. There are occasions where I have a little too much coffee and maybe I have a back-to-back -back meeting schedule all day long. Maybe a couple things don't go my way and then I get some bad news. Come two or three o'clock, I haven't really had lunch, I'm feeling really overwhelmed and I start to get kind of jittery. And it's not just the caffeine jitters, it's the kind of anxious sense, this panic that I've got to do a thousand things at once and somehow I don't feel like I can do any of them. For me, that's the feeling when I start to think, oh, I'm going to look for a coping mechanism. So I want to ask you, what do you feel like in your body right at that moment when you feel like you need to cope? Thank you for the answers that you shared. And I wanna be vulnerable with y'all too. So I have lots of coping mechanisms that can be healthy, right? I love to exercise. I love to eat healthy food and cook. I love to listen to my kids laugh. Um, I also have some stuff that's probably not good. My number one go-to right now is snacking and scrolling. It's a two-handed task where I'm just kind of not paying attention to anything that's going on in the world. I'm just numbing out my brain. I'm kind of becoming absent, right? Snacking and scrolling. Uh, in the past, I've had other coping mechanisms that haven't been helpful as well. I told you I like to eat healthy and I like to exercise. But for me, I've also had times where restricting my, my eating um, developed into an eating disorder. It was this coping mechanism in a time and a place where I felt like I couldn't control anything. I began to really control absolutely everything that went into my body. And so I want us to hear that there's this kind of feeling that we get when we start to recognize, gosh, I'm not feeling okay and I, I wanna balance myself. I wanna kind of, I wanna find a way to be okay. And a lot of times those coping mechanisms become almost automatic. They become things that we do without even noticing. A lot of times I'm snacking and scrolling before I even thought in my mind, 
hey, I don't feel so great. I feel like I need to cope. So for you, it could be something different. Lots of us develop healthy and unhealthy ways of coping, things that, that we do to help kind of feel like we're at equilibrium again. I wanna ask you, how do we cope? Now, I, I want us to be aware that it can be really easy to make a value judgment about our coping mechanisms. And it can be really easy to kind of hide the stuff that feels icky. But we can't know ourselves, our spirituality, our, our movement forward without having a non-judgmental assessment and openness to what it is that we use to cope. And so I want us to be free and honest about how we cope in our world. I think it's fair to say that every human has that sort of feeling where they know they're gonna reach for something to help them feel better. But I wanna acknowledge that for some of us, that feeling feels like panic. It feels like, oh, I'm overwhelmed. We had some people share on Sunday night that they're, they're trying to do everything at once and they can't do anything. That they, they feel so overwhelmed that they have this increase in energy, maybe in their heart rate. Um, and then they, they feel like, gosh, I've gotta do something to help myself feel centered again. Other folks begin to feel themselves pull away. That feeling of needing to cope often can feel like disconnecting or disengaging, disassociating from what's happening in the world, in your life, in the people around you. That feeling of pulling back is for some folks that feeling that precedes needing to cope. I think a lot of times what we're given in our world is the idea that we either need to numb, pull totally away, or we need to overcompensate, overreact, have this way where we're overperforming, we're trying to do eight tasks in the time that it takes us to do two. Both of those are really the options we're presented from the world. And I want us to hear tonight a third way, a different way, that Jesus invites us to be present in our bodies, to stay present, but also to not feel ruled by the narratives that surround us. We heard the scripture read for us, uh, chapter five in Luke's gospel, verses 15 and 16. We heard, but now even more, the report about him went abroad and great crowds gathered to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities. But he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. Some other translations translate that lonely places or places that were deserted. What we're getting this sense of is that Jesus is being kind of overwhelmed by people who, who are sick, who want something from him, who are, who are um, you know, asking of Jesus, Jesus things. And that Jesus finds himself needing to withdraw to a, a place away from people, a place of quiet, a place of solitude. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read that, I'm like, yeah, but it's Jesus and Jesus is God. And so, you know, whatever, he's got supernatural powers. Jesus is like extra special. And maybe Jesus's problems weren't as overwhelming as mine. Like he got to live without social media. 
He got to be at a time when there weren't lights. And so when the lights are off, when the sun is down, you can't do anything else, right? We live in this perpetual world where you can turn a light on, connect to the internet and be expected to be plugged in at all times. So I think we can write off the difficulties that Jesus experienced. But I want us also to hear some of the stuff that's going on in the chapter around the verses we read tonight. Jesus shows up to meet some disciples and they're fishing. He, he meets some guys, they're fishing. He helps them to catch lots of extra fish. Um, and Peter turns around and says, oh, get away from me, I'm a sinful man. And um, Jesus is like, hey, come and follow me. Then a guy with leprosy shows up and is begging Jesus, please, will you heal me? And Jesus is attending to this guy's needs. Then he tells the guy to go and report it to the synagogue just to, to be able to make the sacrifices prescribed by Moses and not to spread word. But you know, when cool things like that happen, word spreads. And so we hear throughout this chapter, the crowds are building, the people, they are becoming more and more numerous. And then a guy who had been paralyzed is on a stretcher and is lowered by his friends in front of Jesus in the midst of the crowds he's already in. You ever have those moments? You're already in a crowd, a, a whole long to-do list. There is already a room full of things for you to do and someone lowers another problem directly in front of your face, right? I mean, we often read that story and we love those friends and we, we laud those friends for that kind of love and we celebrate the guy, but also Jesus, right? He's gotta be tired, it's a lot. And then we hear a couple verses later about Jesus needing to withdraw to desolate places. He comes back from the crowds and it starts up again. Jesus immediately is confronted by Pharisees who are mischaracterizing him and really making character judgments against him. And then Jesus goes back to meeting people and calling more disciples. His need for rest, while it's in a different time and place, is certainly like ours. He hasn't escaped the sense of overwhelm that humans can have or the need for quiet, the need for getting ourselves back into our bodies, grounded in the stories that we know are true when we are surrounded by stories elsewhere. So one, I want us to hear that Jesus needed silence too. Jesus needed time to simply hear his own thoughts or to hear nothing. Jesus needed time to be reminded in the silence of who he was as a being, not simply what he was doing. Jesus needed quiet. And y'all, I think we do too. We're getting this model from Jesus, son of God, incredible capacity, overwhelmed by the stuff surrounding him, good and right and holy things. It's not like Jesus was spending his time frivolously and yet he still gave himself permission and needed time quiet. I want us to hear this as a third way. It's not simply trying to overfunction, right? Jesus could say, forget that nap, forget that prayer. I could get three more people healed if I just hurry up. And it's not also Jesus kind of numbing out, right? He's finding ways to remain present in prayer and in silence, not physically present with people, but physically present in himself particularly in our world filled with screens, it's really easy to go somewhere deep in our brains where we are not even aware of the physical experiences our body is having. It's like when you're scrolling and you're, or you're reading something, you're connected in some way to a screen and you don't realize how much time has even passed or that someone's put their hand on your shoulder or that some chaotic event is happening down the street. There's a way that we can go into ourselves so deeply that we're no longer present. And it's a rest that isn't restful. It's a quiet that has no solitude. Our invitation by the scriptures and by Jesus's modeling is this capacity to not overfunction or just numb, but to recognize the need to be regrounded in who we are, not for what we do, but for who we are, to be reconnected with God, to remember the story that's true about us, the most true story, regardless of character assassinations and needs and people who are deciding where your priorities are, this opportunity in silence to recenter. 
And so tonight, we're actually gonna practice that together. Now, I know on the internet, it can feel a little strange to be in silence together with people. But I wanna invite you to this practice as we hold this space and time together. If you've practiced meditation before, you've practiced centering prayer, three minutes of silence will feel like nothing. But if you, like lots of us, live in a really loud and busy world, three minutes of silence might feel anxiety provoking, it might feel unproductive, or it might feel like the first break you've had in a long time. So I wanna encourage you, find a comfortable place and way to sit. Turn off the notifications for all of the things that will come across your screen, on your phone or on your computer. Turn off the TV in the other room. Maybe ask the other folks that are around you if they wanna join you in this time of quiet. Do what you can to create some space for yourself as we enter into this time of quiet together. Now I also wanna offer this word. It can be really easy when we sit in silence to simply go through our to-do list or to remember all the things we don't like about ourselves, or to spend all of our time thinking things and then judging ourselves for thinking of things and then judging ourselves for being the people who judge ourselves for thinking the things. You can see where this goes. It is a devolving cycle where we simply never get out. So I wanna invite you in this time of silence, if something passes through your brain, let it flow. We're in the stream, let it keep on flowing and return to this time of silence together. After we're done, we're gonna come back and talk about it. So I wanna invite you, get comfy, and enjoy this silence together.
Okay, now remember that we can be real with each other. I wanna ask you, how did that go? What did you think? What did you feel? How did your body respond in silence? As we close tonight, I want to invite you to carve out some time of silence for yourself. Maybe it's just turning off the radio when you're in the car. Maybe it's not putting your headphones in while you stand and wait for the train or the bus. Maybe it's the first three minutes of your day, not picking up your phone or even leaving your bed, but just sitting in silence, engaging the day, waking up, being present. As we go through these practices each week, we wanna not just practice them together, but have them be an opportunity to be integrated in our own spiritual lives. And so we wanna hear more feedback from you. If you begin to practice silence once a week, twice a week, how did that go? What did it feel like? What has it done to the stories that you're telling yourself about your world, about who you are? How has it impacted you? Thanks for practicing together. And remember, these are practices. And so even the most spiritually adept people in the world, monks in the middle of the desert, y'all, they had to practice. And so go and practice this week. Oh, Spirit of God, Speak your peace, speak your peace. Oh, Spirit of God, speak your peace, speak your peace. Now and at the hour. Of our day, Amen, Amen. Now and at the hour of our day, Amen. Oh, merciful God, for.
This Lent, the whole church is reading a book together, and we want to invite you to join us. Throughout this season, we're reading Magre de Vega's Embracing the Uncertain. It's about following Jesus in uncertain times, and it takes uh, different stories from the gospel between when Jesus is an adolescent and when he is uh, in Jerusalem on his way to the cross. What happens in that in-between time, in, in, in the humanness, in his life, in the stories of the gospels? Each week we're reading that together and discussing it on Sunday morning uh, and also on Monday evening. And if there are those of you online who'd like to create space to discuss it together, we'd love to help make that happen. Each story includes some questions and an opportunity for us to reflect together. And so you can join us by ordering the book and jumping in. We also wanna invite you to continue to participate in serving alongside our co-op partners. This week, one of the co-op partners on our campus, The Picnic Project, is involved in a really cool opportunity called the Victory Cup. Victory Cup Initiative is an opportunity for nonprofits to tell their stories and to fundraise amongst people who wanna make impacts in the community. And so we wanna encourage you to go look up Victory Cup, to check out the work of Picnic Project, and to find ways to support that incredible work, uh, the work that they do in feeding community members and in also bridging the social services that exist in our community so folks don't have to travel all over town to get an ID, to find housing referrals, to have shoes and boots for work and to get mental health resources. And so this week we want to highlight the Picnic Project's incredible work and invite you to join them and make sure to follow Victory Cup Initiative and find out on Thursday morning if they win. We, as always, want to invite you to continue to support the work of the church and all of its ministries by following the QR code. We appreciate all the ways that your financial support helps make it possible for us to engage with our co-op partners, to love and serve our neighbors, and to engage in worship together. Thank you. Friends, it is my hope that as we are approaching worship together, as we share this space, uh, regardless of time and physical location, that there is space for you at this table. That God invites each of us to be present, to be known, and to be loved, and that there is space regardless of what the world may have told us, what we have experienced in our lives surrounding church, surrounding our, our acceptance in any kind of social situation. God looks past all of that and God sees us as us and that's a beautiful thing and so may you know that you are welcome and you are loved and you are known. In the 
week as we go out into the world in our busyness and our numbing and our coping and our senses in our body that we need to find some way to be okay I want to invite us to leaning in to a quiet presence know that in your silence you can be reminded of the goodness of God that is implanted in your heart and mind and the story that is most true about you and now may the Lord bless you and keep you May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace this day and forevermore. Amen.